Okay, we'll start with this. IBF bantamweight champion Miyo Yoshida of Japan recently spoke to boxing scene and expressed her interest in unifying titles with one of the other champions at the weight, to which Sharita Metcalf of the United States responded, so Miyo is really ducking this action, and just like the other lame-ass world champions, they come with the same excuse, I beat your ass, now give me my fair shot. Here's what happened. In November of last year, Sharita Metcalf beat Miyo Yoshida for IBF interim status that was in November, so that in December, Miyo Yoshida could be afforded an opportunity to face Ebony Bridges, then champion, as a late replacement. Miyo stood in for Avril Mathy, who pulled out at the last minute, and much to my surprise, Miyo Yoshida was able to pull it off. She beat Ebony Bridges and became IBF champion. A testament to how funny boxing can be sometimes. That Sharita already beat Mio Yoshida for a chance to fight for the full title, just for Mio to get a shot at the full title ahead of her. Now, it's up to the IBF. It's up to the IBF when they want to order the rematch between Sharita Metcalf and Mio Yoshida. It's been approximately six going on seven months since they fought. Yeah. And they haven't ordered it. At the same time, I've seen no talks or no new news about Mio fighting Ebony again in a rematch. I don't even know if Ebony's still with Matchroom. I don't know what, if any, effort has been made to give Ebony a shot to win her title back, but we're about five going on six months into this year, and there's been no news of a rematch. Mio herself, she's talking about fighting the other champions at the weight, of which there are two. Shernika Johnson and Dina Dawson. Now, Shernika Johnson is otherwise preoccupied. She won a WBA title in her last fight against then champion Nina Hughes, and there's supposed to be a rematch between them. That rules her out, which leaves Dina Thorslin, who was in action this past weekend in defense of her WBO, WBC titles. She's the only champion available for Mio to unify with, so she's got to make a decision. She's got to make a choice. You either unify with Dina Thorsland in a fight that you might lose, or you run it back with Sharita in another fight that you might lose. She already lost to Sharita Metcalf before. She lost to her late last year in November. If she fights her again, she might lose again and effectively lose her world champion status in the process, which means you've got to parlay that title into the best payday that you can because you could lose to Sharita just as easily as you could lose to Dina, but maybe fighting Dina pays better. Maybe fighting Dina gets you more money. Dina Thorsland isn't with a major promotional outfit, no. She's not handing out life-altering paydays, but I do think that fighting Dina would pay more than fighting Sharita. Out of those two fights, which one do I think pays better? I think the Thorsland fight pays better than the Metcalf fight, that's what I think. And a Bridges rematch? Not that that's on the table, because it isn't, but I think a Bridges rematch might pay the same or better. Then why isn't that happening? I'm not sure. I get the sense that Ebony Bridges and Matchroom, Eddie Hearn, they're not seeing eye to eye when it comes to the money, and that's why Ebony Bridges has been left in limbo. No talks of a Yoshida rematch, no talks of a return fight. Nothing. Mio said she wants to unify, but there's only one champion available to unify with, and that's Dina Thorsland, who just fought just fought this past weekend. So if you don't want to be bogged down with a potential order from the IBF to fight Sharita Metcalf again, you've got to fight Dina. You've got to unify with her. There's no two ways about it. Nope. She's stuck between a rock and a hard place. Dina Thorsland, by and large, is the very best fighter, the best champion 
at 118 pounds. And I think she'd beat Miyo Yoshida like a drum. She stands a slightly better chance of beating Shirita in a rematch, but I say slightly because it's all relative. That's compared to a Thorsland fight. In a general sense, what lost Miyo Yoshida the Metcalf fight is that a feet are too slow. She's got the right style for the job and combinations, a little bit of power, and she was coming on late into their fight, but it was too little and too late. Her feet are too slow. She couldn't keep up with and keep on Sharita in the early goings of the match. Sharita's a moving target and an outside fighter, long and limber for the weight. In the early goings of the fight, she was out hustling Mio Yoshida, out maneuvering her. Thus, if Mio were to face her for a second time, she'd have to start early, start a lot earlier than she did before. Four. Applying pressure, landing punches. I don't know if she can do that, but she would have to to stay IBF champion. I don't know what Mio's gonna do, what direction she's gonna go in, but that's the situation at 118 pounds. Elsewhere in the world of boxing, snack empresario Victor Conti took to social media saying, Enough ignorant talk about Devin Haney coming in 25 pounds over for the Regis Progray fight. Understand, on fight night, when boxers briefly step on the scale, they have long sleeve shirts pants and shoes and who knows what all in their pockets these weights are not precise what victor conti's referring to is a mock-up documentary in reference to the california athletic commission's provisions on rehydration weight for fighters what is permissible and what isn't and how that reflects on devin haney in the regis pro gray fight for walking in in excess of 25 pounds. What does that have to do with Ryan? Absolutely nothing. But this makeshift documentary surfaced as Ryan Garcia's anti-doping fiasco kicked off, likely in an effort to try to make Devin seem like a bad guy, make him seem like a villain. What? The effort that has gone into trying to make Ryan's anti-doping case about something that it isn't, making it about Victor Conti or making it about Devin's rehydration weight. It's all intended to be a distraction, something to take your eyes and your attention away from Ryan's situation to focus onto something else. So you don't talk about Ryan. The documentary, the makeshift documentary, it's been getting around and people are talking about it. Content creators, shameless ones, are capitalizing off what can only be described as a manufactured controversy because there is no controversy at all here and now Devin Haney is not under investigation he's not under threat of penalty he didn't actually break any rules he didn't no he didn't and what you're getting is a narrative fragmented bits and pieces of information to make it seem as if Devin is in the hot seat or Devin is under threat of suspension under threat of being reprimanded for something something that he did when he isn't. He's not the one in the hot seat. He's not the one that may have to serve a six month to a two year ban for something that he did. No, that's Ryan. He's the one who's under threat of penalty. Ryan Garcia who said one day, I will box again. Oh, I take it that the conspiracy about the Democrats and Victor Conti setting you up isn't going over so well? One day he'll box again, why? Is he not gonna box any time in the near future? Some out there feel that the New York State Athletic Commission may so decide to make an example out of Ryan due to the high profile of his situation. And it's not your ordinary anti-doping case. Many fly under the radar, like Erica Cruz's anti-doping case. She just tested positive for Winstrol, but nobody's talking about it. No, they're stuck on Ryan. Spoke to Rachel Donaire here on the channel, someone who's in the loop, in the know, and understands how these things work, and she feels that they might so decide to make an example out of Ryan because this situation's profile, too many people know about it. I'm not as optimistic. I just don't have that kind of faith in the powers that be, in the people in boxing, that they would so decide to make an example out of a moneymaker like Ryan Garcia. In spite of all the hullabaloo in association with all of this, when have the penalties for doping in the sport ever been harsh? That is, when have they ever been harsh in America? In other countries, maybe, but not this one. Not historically. So I'm not expecting much. Though on the predication that they do choose to make an example out of Ryan, they give him a two-year ban. Well, that would definitely stifle his momentum. Well, what about the hair follicle test and the test coming back negative? Well, if you know anything about PEDs, if you know anything about banned substances, you'll know that not all banned substances are created equal. That's one. And that hair follicle testing for osterin 
it isn't foolproof. That's two. Just because a hair follicle test comes back negative, that doesn't mean you throw out the urinalysis that comes back positive. That's three. Maybe thinking to yourself, well, where'd you get that from? I'll tell you where I got that from. I got it from Pascal Kintz, expert in the field, who wrote a paper on it in 2022. The same Pascal Kintz that Ryan Garcia hired to test his own hair samples. That's where I got it from. Just because a hair follicle test comes back negative, that doesn't mean you throw out the urinalysis that comes back positive. You got that, Bill Nye, the science guy? Science guys and many that all of a sudden fancy themselves lab techs and biochemists who think they understand what's going on, they don't. I saw Ryan Garcia had to apologize to Logan Paul. Throughout all of this, Ryan has been saying some not so nice things about Logan, about his soft drink, Prime. Defaming Logan, defaming his brand. Thus, Logan Paul and his legal team took legal action and filed a defamation suit, explaining why Ryan all of a sudden wants to play nice and wants to apologize. I told you that he was punching above his weight, that your secret weapon is that you're a social media influencer, but you're not a bigger influencer than he is. He's got more followers than you do, more pull, more juice, more money, more influence. Not surprised to see that a few days after Logan filed suit, Ryan has taken it all back. You watch your mouth. You watch your fucking mouth. You little shit bird. You're not out of the woods yet. <laughs> the takeaway for me from all of this isn't even necessarily related to doping or doping in the sport of boxing being widespread so much as when people make up their minds about something, there's no convincing them of otherwise. That those who want to believe Ryan is innocent are going to believe Ryan is innocent no matter how it looks and no matter what comes out. And even the ones who don't, they'll pretend like they do so that they can make money from it. I mean, why are we all of a sudden talking about Devin's rehydration weight as if that has anything to do with Ryan's situation? Any bearing? It doesn't. Devin's rehydration Hydration weight bothers you. Take a number, because there are a lot of guys that are doing what Devin is doing. David Benavidez is doing it. Brandon Figueroa, Sebastian Fundora, these unusually big guys for the weights that they campaign in. What do you think they're doing? And all that selective outrage for what is a common practice in postmodern boxing. Now this bothers you? Picked a hell of a time to start talking about it. Do you think talking about it and distracting people is somehow going to help Ryan? Attacking Devin's character is supposed to help Ryan. Ryan pops hot for Oster in two times and now you want to start talking about rehydration weight shameless as far as i'm concerned ryan cheated he knew that he was cheating and he thought that he could beat the test a lot of guys do simple as that but if you want to know what i think and you're here so i'll assume that you do yeah ryan cheated no elaborate explanations are necessary ryan if you were the commissioner of boxing what was one thing you would change imagine a boxing league where you could do steroids i think you've been in the ring with someone that's uh, right, some breaking news just in to us. Uh, the rematch between Tyson Fury and Alexander Usyk is scheduled to take place on the 21st of December 2024 after Usyk was crowned a historic undisputed champion in that battle out in Saudi Arabia, which was a 12-round classic. So it will be 21st of December. There's so many things like now you're wondering. I don't think Usyk will retire, even though he could. He could, yeah, he's completed he, it. He's completed it, completed it, mate. <laughs> he could, but I think he'll go again. Just why not? Um, I think the people around Fury will convince him to do it again. Especially but I think I don't think Fury wants to walk away from boxing yet either. And then what are the alternatives? Does he want to fight Joshua? And now all of a sudden people are really excited about Joshua. So that mentality's changed when it was always just a foregone conclusion. If those two box, Fury would just stand him on his head. But now there's people out there that will be back in Joshua in that, in that fight. If they do rematch immediately, who do both of you fancy in that do you go repeat or revenge so do you think Usyk has got his number and Fury can't change or do you think that actually if Fury would have been able to maintain what he was doing in those middle rounds that he could uh, could avenge it no Usyk wins again I think more convincingly too wow because it's what he's would have done mentally remember how much of a a mental sort of fighter Fury is and he relies on getting in your head and he struggled. He knew he couldn't get into someone's head that night and I think Usyk was in his and, you know, he's getting into the ring with someone that's beat him now. What's that going to do? Just so happens to be my favorite super bantamweight, Ellie Scottney! Of Catford. On Sky Sports, said alongside former super middleweight champion George Groves, she doesn't like Fury's chances in a rematch. Neither does George Groves, neither do I. Is that as much? Initially, they were talking about running it back in October, I think it was. Now it's been moved to December. And it's official per Turkey Al-Sheikh 
himself. December 21st. In Saudi. And barring unforeseen circumstances, illness, or injury, the second fight will take place in the same calendar year as the first. Let's get this over with. I didn't think Fury would pursue a rematch, and a part of me remains skeptical as to whether or not this rematch will happen. I figured... Usyk's gonna beat this guy. When he beats this guy, Fury's not gonna wanna run it back. He's not gonna wanna rematch. That's what I thought. Though it would have been bad optics for Fury, even worse optics for Fury, if you have a rematch clause in play and you can activate it, but you don't. I mean, Anthony Joshua, he got a second crack at the apple. He wanted a rematch with Usyk and he got it and he lost. Like you're about to. Fury fighting this guy before the year is out bags certain questions. Is he going to sort out his corner situation? Because there's been a lot of talk about that. Power struggle between John Fury and Sugar Hill Stewart. Too many people shouting, too many instructions at one guy who likely isn't listening. It's overstated. I think it is. I don't think Fury lost that fight because there's too many chiefs and not enough Indians. I think he lost the fight because of why I said he'd lose the fight. He doesn't actually do anything better than Oleksandr Yusik from a nuts and bolts boxing perspective. He's not a better boxer than Usyk, he's just bigger. Doesn't take that great a punch either, I told you he was chinny. But there's a lot of talk about his corner situation. For a long time now, John Fury has been saying he would like Sugar Hill Stewart sacked. He would like him to be removed from Tyson Fury's team. Is that what Tyson Fury's gonna do? Is he gonna hire a new trainer, try to do things differently, and if he does, will that help? Does he fire Sugar Hill Stewart? Does he get rid of him or does he get rid of John? What I think... Whether he fires Sugar Hill Stewart or not, you don't need John in the corner. John is not your head trainer. He's your father, and he's a little bit too close to the action, creating too many waves. Waves before the fight, waves during the fight. You had button members of Usyk's team before the fight. You're in a foreign country, and you're behaving like a football hooligan. You're a grown man, an elderly man. That's before the fight, during the fight. What do you got it in your head? That you're the head trainer? That Tyson Fury should adhere to instructions from you. You're making it difficult for Sugar Hill Stewart to do his job. The job that Fury is paying him to do. John's the one that doesn't need to be there. Whether Fury fires Sugar Hill Stewart or he doesn't fire Sugar Hill Stewart, it's John Fury that doesn't need to be in the corner. No, you need to be sat down ringside in your place because you're a background character. It's not the John Fury show. It doesn't matter to me. Keep the corner the way it is. You don't keep the corner the way it is. If you fight Usyk again, He's gonna beat you again, perhaps in better fashion than he did the first time. This time, he might stop you. Why? In a rematch, Fury will tell himself, I'm not gonna give away the first two rounds dicking around and showboating. I'm gonna start, and I'm gonna start earlier. And the earlier you start... Try to use your size? The earlier he's gonna land on you. Land on you like he did the last time. The earlier you start, the earlier he plants one on you that hurts you the same way you were hurt in the ninth round. These people ain't got no memory and no attention for detail that what got Tyson Fury hurt was trying to come forward, was trying to use his size. He was putting punches together and he got countered in between by a right hand, left hand combination that sent him careening into the ropes and he was left at the mercy of Oleksandr Yusik. It was coming forward and using his size that got him. That's what got him countered. Far too much is being made of what limited success Fury had in the fight, which for me was really just limited to rounds four, five, six, and seven. You could probably give him one more round if you're generous, but I'm not. So you want to fight that guy again? You want to run it back? You want to lose again? You're going to. I've got Usyk in a rematch, but you already knew that.